and we're rolling. Ready? Yeah. I'm, yep. Except I look like a ghost. On Can't do circle. anything about it. We'll get better okay. cameras soon. I'm mad about ghost face. You're that in I the, have. You're in the light. Mm-hmm. It'll be gone soon. Ooh, Alec, did you just dim? The, I was just complaining that I look like a ghost uh, on the camera. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm Kat. The clouds dimmed the light. Oh. <laughs> and I'm Haley. That was perfect timing. <laughs> really the sun was. was shining right in my face, and I looked like we had turned the exposure all the way up on, um, like, a MySpace You're filter. Like, I just tanned. <laughs> I, I really did so that I wouldn't look like a ghost. But we're here. Um, how do we normally do this? You say, and this is night class. And this is night class. And then I say, a tipsy night class, teaching the oddities and curiosities you never learned in school. What are you teaching on this learning journey, Haley? On this learning journey, I am going to make the connection in history between the world wars and modern day breast implants, fillers, facelifts, and things of the sort. Wow, we have like a sociology thesis happening. Yeah, okay. Truly, what are you teaching us today? I will tell you about how incest led to the downfall of a centuries old empire. Oh my gosh, incest could lead to so many things. That's so dramatic. It can lead to a lot of things. <laughs> this uh, is one many of, of them the- bad. <laughs> just one of the side effects of incest. <laughs> just, just one of a few. <laughs> Historically significant side effect of incest Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. nice okay well yeah and this is actually a highly requested lesson i've gotten this as a suggestion many a time so we're finally doing it cool i it's crazy i have no idea what it could be all i'm thinking is like the habsburg straw oh okay (laughs) okay so i know you got it ding 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 (laughs) that's amazing (laughs) okay well, well, we're we're back. Haley it's all left we need. me. <laughs> I did. I was gone. I was working from home. If you're listening <laughs> from my work, <laughs> but I'm back now. Back in person. Yeah, you are <laughs> back. And we watched. <laughs> <laughs> we watched your cats, and we were really lucky to have them. Um, because you? it turned into a cat war against, <laughs> against Georgia? a cockroach. <laughs> and we were I glad to have an army to sick on Safety, it. Safty, like when we got back, there was one fly in the house and he was like on his A game. I swear, <laughs> as soon as I let him out, he didn't want to cuddle with me. He was like, there's a fly in this house and it must die. And usually he just like plays with it, you know? They're very useful. Um, I'll let Alec tell this story because there's more. Okay, so our power went out. I know what story she's talking about. Our power went out for 24 hours. So the 24 house- hours. Why? In Memphis summer um, because uh, MLGW sucks. Yeah. yeah, a transformer blew up. But anyway, <laughs> the house got really hot. So it was like sleeping in a jungle. And I woke up at like 3 in the morning and I like looked over and as if I had a premonition, I just like looked at Kat's <laughs> ass. And, and it was out because I was in my underwear on top of the blankets because there was no fucking power and it was a million <laughs> degrees. And I'm I, proud of you for like wearing anything. Honestly, I'd be just like bare bones. I'm really glad I was wearing underwear when you hear what happens next. Oh, no, I'm scared. <laughs> but I didn't I don't have my contacts in, but my eyes adjust and I'm like, I think that's a cockroach right on her ass. <gasps> But I'm like, I must be like in a dream state because oh why would God. there be, because it was the size of like a matchbook or a, like a Hot Wheels car. You're like, babe, I don't think you wiped. <laughs> oh, no. No, it wasn't there. It was on a cheek. But then I see it move slightly. Oh, so I'm like, no. oh shit. Oh, my God. And so I slap her ass really hard, like <laughs> not to crush it, but to get it off the bed. And she sleeps right through it. But I thought How? like I'm a very happy sleeper. But I thought like, wow, what if she wakes up and just thinks I'm slapping her ass? <laughs> but so I see roughly where the thing flies. Again, I can't turn on any lights, but Kat had this little laser pointer flashlight that we were playing with um, with the cats. And so I like turned that on and it has a little flashlight on it. So yeah. I don't have my contacts in. I'm shining it. I see it on the floor. And then girly, your cat comes in, because we're pet sitting. And I'm like, girly, like, 
help me out here. And so she's on it with me and we're like running with it into the hallway and I'm trying to kill it with the flashlight. But it keeps running at my bare feet and I can't quite see it. It's trying to attack you. Yeah, and oh so then God. it starts coming up the wall. So then I whack it with the flashlight and it falls down. <laughs> and then Safty comes in, your other cat, to help me. And then it runs into like our little broom closet. And so I can't see anything in there. And then Ghost and Ernie and the other two cats come up. And so all four cats were staring at the maintenance closet with me. And I just like looked at them and it was so dark in the house. I was just like, this is you guys. This is your battle now. And I went back to bed. <laughs> and we haven't seen a roach since. <laughs> oh, my God. Did you open the door to the closet so they could get in? Yeah. 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 I oh, left them with amazing. all four staring into the closet. I like that they went about it with teamwork. I'm at mm-hmm. least assuming because sometimes it's like if, if one of our pets has a toy and the other one's not playing with it, they'll just watch it. Yeah, um, but they were all highly motivated. They were ready like. to get it, and I'm wondering which one ate it because we didn't find the body. Uh oh. Are either Murder of your investigation. cats? Are either of your cats bug eaters? Um. Well, yeah. Safty. Okay. His face like blew up when he tried to eat a wasp. That's <laughs> what I was thinking. Is Safty probably ate it? Because ours will yeah. play with the bugs, but they don't normally like crunch on it. Safty is a garbage can. <laughs> he will eat anything and everything. He had some really stinky farts too when I brought him home yesterday. So maybe it was... he was probably eating our cat's food. Because when I feed them, I just put all the food there, and yeah. then they choose which one they want to eat, and they traded food every single they time. They always trade food. Mm-hmm. It's new. They're like, ooh. Yeah, it's special. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think Girly ate the entire time. I didn't see her ever oh eat. Oh, my God. I literally said that because she looked so skinny to me. Yeah. I'm like, Tommy, I think she's lost a pound. I don't think she was eating. It so. was the weirdest thing because she would come out when they'd all eat and like want food. And she'd see me put it down and then she would just walk away. She, I think, has become accustomed to what Tommy calls secret because he'll <laughs> she doesn't oh, know what? What it <laughs> it's secret feedings because safety will like eat 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 like eat until it's gone and she'll just have a few pebbles on oh. their scheduled feeding time but then she'll cry throughout the day because she's hungry so S- tommy will have to go and get her like secret food oh. it's like secret time maybe <laughs> that's Safdie why was. she was all over me as she was begging she for was food trying she, to was <laughs> she was starving oh starving. my god poor the baby <laughs> yeah. i just figured she was eating like because they never like all finish their food there's always some left in the bowl i just figured she was going she back go in at night or it. something no she needed her special secret food okay well I now i know to give her secret <laughs> what is it called we just call it secret just secret you have her secret <laughs> okay <laughs> just another dumb thing we say in our house <laughs> yeah she looked lighter and tommy saw mm-hmm. her too he's like oh my god what if like she was just the abused stepchild and we locked her in the closet the whole time and oh purposely my- God, yeah. Feeder. She's the odd one out. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of the black sheep, she's the white sheep. <laughs> is that what happened? Is yeah, that a confession? That's a, that every accusation is a confession. Well, I guess you'll just Sorry. continue watching the <laughs> Yeah, they have nowhere free. else to go. <laughs> Girl, we'll just have to deal with it. <laughs> well, thank you for watching them. I'm glad that we were able to uh, extinguish the cockroach for you guys. Yeah, that was very, very helpful. I'm so shocked that you didn't wake up when he slapped your ass. Me too. But also, <laughs> like, I sleep very heavily. I have my sleep mask on. I take my melatonin. And, yeah. like, I do not wake up. That is so impressive. As I was saying before this, I forgot my Lexapro and all my other medication while I was gone. Um, So by the last night, I was, I think, starting to get crabby and a little sleep deprived because we're sleeping on an air mattress. Mm. And the next morning I had to apologize to Tommy for how (laughs) I was kind of bitchy at him in the night being like, prop yourself up like you're snoring. (laughs) That's rough. And I bet the air mattress only made things worse. Yeah. Well, you know, it is. Say lovey. Yeah. It's what it's. It's what it's. Any other fun things? Only one. Okay. I uh, I consider myself an influencer. No, I don't. Not for money. Now you Just are, according. for <laughs> things I like and want to tell you about. Do you have something that you're going to influence me on? Yes. So you know how Trader Joe's uh, peanut butter cups are really good. They're yeah, the best. the best. You know what's even better? No. Is what could be better? Trader Joe's licorice. That Boo. sounds fake. No, 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 no. Licorice. No, 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 no. Answer. No. I'm listening. It's so. Not listening, I mean. Shut up. <laughs> it's not black Listen, licorice. It's not black licorice. It's not even red licorice. It's 
raspberry, green apple, and mango licorice, and it comes in like little three flavors in a pack. You're making a face. It sounds sour. I don't. It's I not don't sour. Like, I don't like fruity gummy. I'm just not into it. So. You would be into this if anyone doesn't like it. I, I, I don't even know. I will put my head in a dirty toilet. Did and you drink bring the water. me a sampling? No, because I ate it all. It was wow. so good. Oh, oh and wow. Alec ate it all too. <laughs> We both ate it all. Yeah, we uh, shared it and then fought over the last piece. <laughs> and that's when he got his revenge. He slapped your ass and they made up a story about the cockroach. <laughs> about the cockroach. <laughs> I was a little scared because I sleep with one leg out of the blankets a lot. And last night I was kind of scared you to do it. You can't anymore. Yeah, I got to protect myself. <laughs> well, you survived it the first time. So maybe I'll just like put like raid on as like a... A sleep mask, yeah, like maybe a pre bedtime be, routine. It'll to give you a little, myself with little killer. burn, but by morning it'll look like a nice fake tan. You know? How yeah. <laughs> maybe it's like a chemical exfoliator. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that would work. That's what they okay. don't want you to know. <laughs> Beauty hack. <laughs> She's an influencer. I'm making a TikTok now. about it later. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, that's a really good way to not get cancer. It sounds like <laughs> never, <laughs> they never. They would never sell me something that could give me cancer. Because why would they? Why would they? They uh, care about our health <laughs> so you much. You can't convince me otherwise. So much. Uh, well, are we? Are we ready? We are. It's okay. your turn to go first. Is I'm it really? My laptop. Are you sure? Or... Yeah. I'm, I just checked. I went first okay. last week. Oh. Oh, what are you drinking? Um, boxed wine that is like three or four months old. Yeah, looked it you up made that last. I did. Um, looked it up today. Six to eight months expiration date for boxed wines. Okay, so, so it's I still to be good. Sure. Yeah, because it's yeah. pretty distinctive. Uh, <laughs> Quadrum Red Blend from 2020. Nice. Uh, Nice, pretty box. And you've got your... I have a truly original lemonade. Um, Still not good as the Simply Spiked lemonade, but uh, we're trying to get rid of them. So going to be drinking that. We can do that. Yeah, double down today. You got two in the queue. I have two. I don't know if I'll start the second one, but I'll definitely finish this first one. Hell yeah. (laughs) Wednesday night. Let's go. Woo, party. (laughs) All right. So King Charles II of Spain or Carlos II in Spanish was born November. 6 1661 so I think that makes him a Scorpio oh I love the 1661 when numbers mirror each other mm. it's like oh I love Feels it so good. much okay. yeah or like if a number is like 235 for example very good number why because two plus three equals five. Oh, yes okay. see this is that's ADHD right there that is what it's <laughs> like my <laughs> I'm constantly looking for numbers <laughs> I did that today though that's so weird I really? saw like these two chairs the way they were stacked on top of each other made a perfect like six hard oh. to explain but I saw the number six and then I was like what if I can find two other sixes like in the same like frame of vision and then and then you it'll did. be spooky and then I did ah! there was a clock and one of the door like numbers had a six on it I was like what Ooh, spooky. does it mean it means <laughs> nothing but looking for in that patterns moment, it meant everything synchronicities yeah. in that moment it meant everything <laughs> it meant everything to me it did <laughs> he was the only surviving son of 26 year old Queen Mariana of Austria and her uncle slash husband 56 year old King Philip the fourth of Spain Charles was an extremely sickly child. He had a severe underbite that jutted out so much he was unable to learn how to speak until he was four. Oh my goodness, that that's really tough. Did it in- yeah. impact his ability to eat? Yes, he had a lot of trouble chewing food and this probably contributed to him being so thin yeah. and malnourished. He was like the OG applesauce packet kid. <laughs> <laughs> like when your mouth is wired shut and you just have to inject applesauce through the crack in your right. teeth. Gross. You can't even suction it that well if you had surgery or something. You know, <laughs> you can't do straws. <laughs> Did you ever see those like Facebook things going around of people cutting those applesauce pouches open and they're like full of mold? Oh, yeah. Those Nasty. really, I used to eat those all the time and I, I'm sure that was just like a fake thing or once Ha- that happened but now they freak me out yeah you've you, you're scarred you're scarred it's like the cockroach in the bed <laughs> you can't sleep with your leg out anymore 
He uh, was also super constantly ill, which probably also contributed to his small size. Throughout his childhood, he suffered from illnesses like measles, chicken pox, smallpox, and rubella. Gotta catch them all. <laughs> <laughs> Physically small and weak, his mother feared putting any stress on his body might break him. So she had him carried everywhere until he was eight. He wasn't allowed to walk. Oh my god, he's not even a leash child. He's a fit, he's like probably a baby Bjorn child. <laughs> so much worse. <laughs> I'm going to get a baby Bjorn for safety. <laughs> that would be cute. I've been obsessed with wanting a chihuahua lately. I can totally see you with a chihuahua and you have the experience with peanut. You're a chihuahua girl. I want one so bad. Like I've been looking at rescues trying to find one and I can't have another dog. I know I can't. I have a freaking horse. I have two cats, a dog, and like I don't even own a house. So I mean, mean finding a place to rent with three animals is enough. One more. That's you true. Know, at this point, I think <laughs> if anything, the amount of animals that you do have is the best supporting reason to get another animal i just really want a chihuahua i i'm obsessed with videos of them i think they're so cute and i would definitely get a purse and carry it everywhere you would have to i'd have to and i would put it in little outfits like paris hilton oh my god did you see paris hilton it has a fab fit fun box this summer yes and i was Haley, when i tell you i checked my email every day waiting for like it to be announced what was inside it and then I was supremely disappointed when I wanted nothing in it. I know. I know. I felt the same way. I saw it today. I remember earrings and like a pink record player. I don't remember what else was in it there. Was but like it was like a mm. toy record player. Like it was just the junkiest bullshit in there I've ever seen. No way in hell Paris Hilton ha- like owns any of that shit. It was like ugly uh, like pink aviator glasses from Shein and then Aww. rhinestone earrings and like a spray you put on your face at the beach. It Terrible, <laughs> terrible, but great marketing because I was excited for I the know. drop. I think everyone was, I don't even subscribe to FabFitFun anymore, but I keep getting emails probably because I keep opening them. <laughs> <laughs> the way if there was one single thing in that box that I wanted, I would have bought it just because Immediately. it was Paris marketed Hilton. with Paris Hilton's yes. face on it. This is so funny right now. I'm thinking like, wow, this is what people are talking about when they're like, there's too many tangents. <laughs> too many tangents. And also tangents. that we sound like dumb valley girl bitches. Like, okay, I kind of get it. You know what? It is what it is. It is what it is. I know who I am. You got to embrace who you are. I'm, I'm a basic bitch. <laughs> I'm obsessed with Paris Hilton and Chihuahuas. <laughs> She also didn't require him to bathe or groom himself, as that might be too physically taxing. So he was constantly dirty and smelly. Okay, that's wrong. Yeah. That's like abuse. I think I think that she made a lot of excuses for just like pushing him aside and neglecting him because she also didn't ha- have him receive any education. And she was the queen of Spain. Like they had resources, but she thought like it might be too mentally strenuous. Do you think she... She was doing it because she didn't want to take, like, proper care of him or that there was a stigma around being, like, differently abled or... I think it was a combination of things. I think... I think maybe she was really concerned because she uh, he was the only surviving son, so they needed him to survive to be king. And I also think she wanted power because... It, he was like you'll see in just a moment like he was like she it was kind of a a game of thrones situation with cersei Mm -hmm. like keeping her son kind of like like not wanting him to be super smart so that she could have power you know yeah i think it was partly that But yeah, so he was basically neglected. He never had a chance. Scholars have uh, long believed his mental and physical disabilities are most likely a result of centuries worth of inbreeding. This is a practice pretty common among royal families across the board in order to consolidate their money and power, but the Spanish Habsburgs took it to a new level. The Habsburgs were an extremely old royal family originally from Germany and Austria. They ruled a number of kingdoms around Europe, including Austria, Hungary, Bohemia, Slovenia, Slovakia, Croatia, Poland, Romania, and Italy, beginning in the 13th century, and solidified their rule over Spain and 1506. 
They had to fight really, really hard to get control of Spain, and they're also not native Spaniards. They come from Northern Europe. Mm -hmm. So their grip on that area was fragile. And because they knew this, they had to go to extremes to prevent any possible challenge to that lucrative position. It's crazy how motivating power is. Mm -hmm. And I feel like really addictive for people. Yeah. Just wanting more and more and more. Like once you get your hands on it, it's almost never enough. And some politicians, you know, just like, why? Why? Like, I I don't know why anyone would truly ever want to be like president, for example. I know. I think once you get a taste, you Mm -hmm. can't let it go. I think so, too. Like, I think it's just a disease of the mind. It's addicting. It, Yeah. Yeah. It is an addiction. It's crazy. I I don't understand it, but I've also never been (laughs) powerful. (laughs) So I don't know. I'm, I'm sure I'm sure we're all susceptible. Yeah. The most powerful I've I've ever felt is playing sims <laughs> <laughs> oh i feel so powerful when i play stardew valley hell yeah this it's, it's the summer- my world you're living in it <laughs> the summer season has just started and i'm about to be making so much money does it change as our seasons in real life change no animal crossing does mm-hmm. i think yeah but stardew valley it's each day is 15 minutes and each season is 28 days Oh, okay. So you so is it fifteen <laughs> minutes? No, it's not that long. I don't remember, but, but it's like quick. it goes quick. Yeah, yeah. So that in order to consolidate power, they kept it in the family. Nine out of the eleven total marriages that occurred during their Spanish rule were incestuous, and these were often between closer family members than was typically acceptable at the time. We're talking second cousins and uncle niece relationships were especially popular. So there is a line that they'll draw. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to an extent, I like back then there were definitely all in all royal families like relationships marriages between first cousins and i'm sure nieces and nephews as well but this was like almost every single time it was between a close family member and as their rule progressed people began to notice that many members of the spanish habsburgs shared the same prominent lower jaw This similarity was so striking that like you mentioned at the top of the episode it was nicknamed the habsburg jaw A couple of different things are going on in my mind right now. First of all, I'm wondering if that result of the jaw could be replicated in other family gene pools of like incest. Mm -hmm. And then I'm also wondering if this will become um, something that is a desired trait because it is of the royal family or if it's like, oh, they got the Habsburg (laughs) jaw. Oh, steer clear. I don't know uh, anything about it becoming in fashion. I think people did think it was ugly. Like there was a lot of people making fun (laughs) of them behind their backs. (laughs) And with any trait could Mm -hmm. pop up through incest you know because incest doesn't necessarily mean your genes will mutate more it just means that if your family has quote-unquote undesirable recessive traits if there's not new genes being injected into that gene pool these traits are much more likely to Mm -hmm. get that double recessive and show themselves right really just any trait so if it was Mm -hmm. like you know a, a trendier popular trait like today for example yeah. like a snatched waist like, <laughs> yes. your waist just keeps getting smaller and smaller <laughs> exactly and I mean incest okay objectively it, it doesn't have to be bad like purely yeah. from a like genetic standpoint if your family aren't carriers of like dangerous uh, genes, then it like isn't necessarily bad. You see this with horse breeding, for example. A lot of horse breeds are super, super inbred, and there's a way to do it responsibly as long as you're testing the genetics for undesirable traits, and as long as you're not passing on a bunch of like dangerous mm-hmm. traits, like from a genetic standpoint, not sure. from moral standpoints, it's okay. Um, it just really depends. Like, I think a lot of people hear incest and they just think you become a mutant. Like, that's not true mm-hmm. necessarily. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Anyway, 
Uh, the medical name for this condition with the underbite is called mandibular prognathism or prognathism. Not sure. It's a severe underbite that changes the entire shape of your face. It also kind of like makes the top of your face look a bit concave and makes your teeth unable to align. And I already kind of explained, I don't think I need to really explain the genetics anymore. I mean, sure, I'm, I think I'm good. most people who have who are listening right now have made a Punnett square. You understand recessive and dominant genes. We think mag- mandibular prognathism is a recessive gene. So, you know, the, the gene pool just got a little overwhelmed with it in the family. And where was I? So when the jaw, while the jaw was the most obvious signal of health issues caused by inbreeding in the Habsburgs, it's not the only one. Spanish Habsburgs were plagued by a number of physical and mental maladies resulting in higher than average uh, trigger warning for infant loss here and higher than average miscarriages, stillbirths and infant deaths. Only about half of Spanish Habsburg children live to the age of 10. Wow. Yeah. That's that's really young. <laughs> really, really like a low survival rate, especially because... Due they're, to, so I'm sorry, like due to medical conditions? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And just like being prone to illness mm-hmm. and having different medical conditions... In comparison, there was about an 80% survival rate, typically in other Spanish families of the same time period. So this is very low, especially considering they were royals and had access to everything they could need yeah, or they want. Had all the resources. Exactly. In all, nine consecutive generations of Habsburg rulers, specifically (laughs) Spanish Habsburg rulers, specifically, (laughs) and many of their offspring had Habsburg jaws. And for many, especially Charles, it did not make life easy. One 18th century British historian, Alexander Stanhope, wrote he, quote, has a ravenous stomach and swallows all he eats whole, for his nether jaw stands so much out that his two rows of teeth cannot meet, to compensate which he has a prodigiously prodigious wide throat so that a gizzard or lever of a hen passes down whole and his weak stomach not being able to digest it he voids it in the same manner my goodness i love the term nether jaw (laughs) i know (laughs) it makes it just sound so far away from the rest of his face i think it was (laughs) it just paints the perfect picture like it's no longer a lower jaw because it juts so far out and up it's just away it's almost its own person Uh it's a a standalone jaw (laughs) it's like a teeth or eyes and the, the wrinkle on his chin is talking oh my god yeah you know how like knees have faces his, mm-hmm. his, he's got a chin that has a face that would be kind of cute it would be cute so this quote is obviously hyperbole but the point still stands that it was hard for charles to eat he probably did have to swallow a lot of things whole and people look down on him they made fun of him i mean this was not the most progressive time he definitely faced some social hardships as well as oh. physical yeah, I mean, if he would have been born in, like, the Guinness World's Records era, he would have been set. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's something you necessarily want to be in the Guinness Book of World Records for. Well, plenty of people do and are. That's true. Charles's father ends up dying, and Charles II officially becomes king at the age of four in 1665. His mother ruled as queen regent for 10 years until Charles was a teenager. And even after he came of age, having been deprived of an education and being so ill, it was clear to everyone that he was not fit to rule. His mother would have happily resumed the regency, but her brother, who was a bastard, uh, her quote unquote (laughs) illegitimate brother. You're a bastard, Harry. (laughs) Forcefully took the regency from her. I think there was uh, some, what what word am I looking for? Not violence, (laughs) uh, just sneakiness going around. I don't know exactly what happens, but he is now the regent until Charles is an adult. But even once he was an adult, the kingdom was never really governed by Charles. It was his courtiers that did everything. Essentially, Charles's only duty as king was to produce an heir. 
so <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that just seems like such a wild thing considering everything else I've heard about him and his health. <laughs> yeah, his health yeah, to pass on. Uh, yeah, his she's yeah. like he can't bathe, he'll break. As, but he's gonna fall. Right. And specifically <laughs> they wanted an heir that was related to him. So like that's also very smart. Uh so they start putting out feelers, trying to find him a match once he's a teenager or uh, 20s. And they had his eye on Marie Louise of Orleans in France. And this was Charles's second niece. Marie Louise. Very cute. Very cute. In 1679, they received a letter back from the French ambassador stating Marie wanted nothing to do with Charles as the, quote, Catholic king is so ugly as to cause fear and he looks ill. Well, she didn't have to say that. She could have just politely declined. Yeah. Well, she couldn't really decline because unfortunately for Marie, she did end up marrying him. Ooh, and then you got to you got to face him. You got to marry yeah. the guy that you said that rude thing about. Yeah. I, hopefully they didn't tell him she said that. I don't know. She probably said it straight <laughs> to him. They read the letter and I don't think like, she gave a fuck. Hmm. Okay, it's a go. <laughs> yeah. They're like, she could have said worse. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Maybe that yeah. was the nicest letter they received back. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they go on a, a rant. They could have said this and this. <laughs> or what about, oh, this thing? <laughs> um, so desperate to produce an heir, Charles often slept outside on his father's grave as he believed that would make him more fertile. Yeah, get that daddy blessing. Mm-hmm. It, it checks out. <laughs> It didn't work, though. Her daddy slash uncle slash <laughs> cousin <laughs> slash brother. <laughs> it would have been his second uncle, I think. Okay. So, well, not too bad. But I think... <laughs> mild. I think I read somewhere that his grandma and his aunt were the same person as well. And I don't even when know how you to make sense at, of that. And when you look at the family tree, it's like an inverted triangle. Like, it doesn't branch <laughs> out. It just, like, all goes down into Charles. It's an MLM. <laughs> yeah. It's a reverse pyramid scheme. <laughs> so, like I said, this didn't work. Marie died in 1689 without ever having children. The death of his first wife launched Charles into a severe depression, another illness that the Habsburgs were exceptionally prone to. When Marie died, Charles held onto his wife's lifeless body for days, refusing to allow her to be taken away and buried. When she eventually was buried, he took to sleeping on her grave as well. This is really, really sad. Uh -huh. I wonder who else's graves has he slept on? That seems like something to look into. Yeah, maybe um, he just likes it. That's what I like to tell myself to make myself less sad. And actually, you know, I really can't judge when I was on vacation. I was like, number one thing I want to do is to go to a historical cemetery. Yeah. Like, I just love death. Did you <laughs> get to go? Yeah, okay, we good. did. It, it was sweet. Um, I brought out this this app, the Necrophone. <laughs> I didn't hear anything, but um, it, it was still cool. The vibes were perfect in every way. That sounds fun. Yeah. We need to go back to the Crystal Grotto. We do. I actually have started looking up some historical cemeteries I want to go to here in Memphis. So yeah. if you want to join me, I would love to join it. you. I really want to get into taking etchings, like Ooh. get some charcoal and some parchment paper yeah. and take etchings. That would make some really cool art too. Exactly. To be okay, mm -hmm. let's do it. And have you ever watched the TikToks of that woman who cleans, cleans graves? Oh my god, yes, that is so like top good. tier content. It's mm -hmm. like all of my interests combined, like deep cleaning and death in cemeteries <laughs> yes please it's the perfect either like falling asleep videos or getting ready in the morning videos yeah i mean like, anyway nice you cut background it. i just video. want it all the time i need you know they're talking about implanting things that you're like having those like glasses that you mm -hmm. wear kind of like that guy ned's declassified school yes. survival guide yeah that's what i want i don't want it for work though i want it for those cemetery videos oh who would just want that for work? all the time <laughs> i want that to be my work just watching tiktok me too yeah <laughs> i yeah, guess so me too. i guess that is what i want <laughs> <laughs> I, I now see what i was put on this earth to do <laughs> i would be so good at my job i don't want to be a content creator i want to be a content 
Consumer. Consumer. <laughs> Despite Charles's depression over the loss of his wife, he was advised to quickly remarry, like as in within a couple weeks. His second wife was Marie Anne of Neuborg, who was selected partially due to her family's fertility record. She was one of 23 children. Wow. Mm-hmm. All from like one, one one womb birth I (laughs) I don't don't know know, but I think so the OG 23 kids and counting oh my god (laughs) have you watched shiny happy people no I still need to we've been watching well one we've been watching the new season of I think you should leave Mm, and then we've also been watching Twin Peaks Oh, like okay. the old one from yeah. the 90s. That's been great. And then is there one more thing we've been watching? Oh, we've been watching been triple dipping. Um, well, a little bit of uh, The Last of Us. But I just play Small my doses. switch while Alec watches <laughs> oh my so God. that I only have to half watch. Unfortunately, Charles never managed to father a child with Marie. He died in 1700 at the age of 39, which pretty that's good. that's pretty good. I'm that, impressed. I'm impressed too. Like considering how sick he was his whole life and how he had all those like deadly childhood diseases and didn't fucking die, it's impressive. The doctor who conducted his autopsy reported the body, quote, did not contain a single drop of blood. His what? heart was the size of a peppercorn. His lungs corroded. His intestine intestines rotten and gangrenous. He had a single testicle black as coal, and his head was full of water. <laughs> That's insane. Yeah. <laughs> his testicle is black. Yeah, he probably, it probably burned after he tried so much to have kids. Oh, my. I have a joke about this for when I do, like, stand-up one day. Okay. Not about this specifically, but there are just some obituaries that it's like, you didn't need to say that. Like, lie. For real. <laughs> and this was an official autopsy report from a doctor. His, his skull is full of water. Well, we do have... So... So what happened? He had a koala brain. (laughs) Modern researchers have like analyzed this report and tried to come up with what they think was like actually going on here. (laughs) The last sentence. And he was ugly. And he was hideous. (laughs) (laughs) And he smelled bad. They think Charles suffered from hydrocephalus, which would have resulted from a past case of measles, which is excess water in the brain. He for sure had measles. He was probably well. He did have measles, child. But they they think like since he had measles, this is what he likely had water in his head. They also think he had a pituitary hormone deficiency, which would have stunted his growth. And based on the autopsy record, urologist Professor Van Karabrock says, "quote We can conclude that Carlos suffered from posterior." Hypospadias, spadias, hypospadosis, hypospadias, <laughs> monochrism. I swear I practiced this. Monor, monarchism. Just make it up. And an atrophic testicle. He probably had an intersexual state with ambiguous genitalia and a congenital mono kidney with stones and infections. Just had a lot going on. He had a lot going on, and <laughs> that's like those um, all American girl doll skits. They they <laughs> do. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I think it's pretty safe to conclude that Charles was probably not physically able to have biological children, which was a reality that ultimately ended Habsburg rule in Spain. He didn't produce an heir to the crown. And people have long said, like, incest ended the Habsburg dynasty, which until recently, we weren't sure if that was necessarily true, like if it was definitely incest that caused all his health issues. Um, so people who are skeptical of this say that, like, he did have a sister, Margaret, who was his full sister, Margaret Teresa, his sister, mom. No, just his regular (laughs) sister. And she shared none of his mental or physical health complications. So they're like, somebody was cheating to her. (laughs) Somebody was cheating. If she came out (laughs) without any ailments and he was uh, all the things that he was, somebody's not telling the truth. (laughs) But I mean, there were people in this family that escaped without the, without. The Charles yeah, syndrome because they were out cheating no <laughs> they weren't <laughs> they just got lucky 
Some researchers postulated that it was a herpetic infection that Charles contracted at birth that worsened his health, not necessarily uh, genetic diseases. So geneticist Roman Vilas of Spain's University of Santiago de Compostela decided to conduct a study on the Habsburg family line to find out if the jaw at the very least was genetic and due to inbreeding. They're like, let's hmm. just like put these naysayers to rest. We all can see that this is inbreeding, but let's just like <laughs> let's put some research science. behind it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he and his colleagues examined Habsburg portraits and family trees going back 20 plus generations. Through their research, they determined that an average breeding coefficient for the family was 0.93. What does that mean? I will tell you. (laughs) It means that roughly 9% of each royal's genes were identical. And to put that in perspective, a child born to two first cousins would have an inbreeding coefficient of 0.0625. So 0.093 is high. Highly significant, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. For some reason, this is just leading me on a brain train where it's like you know their their genes start to become less and less diverse as they keep inbreeding and it made me think of Spongebob that one episode where he becomes like polished like professional Spongebob (laughs) and he's all like smoothed out like you just start to lose all your features normal Bob yeah normal Bob (laughs) you become normal Bob (laughs) Uh, it was making me think of the episode of Spongebob where (laughs) we're just always thinking about Spongebob (laughs) we're at the beginning of the episode where I said he didn't bathe and he was stinky Mm -hmm. and like I was just picturing people avoiding him and he's thinks he's ugly but he i'm not ugly i i'm smelly what's yes. the spongebob line i don't remember but i know exactly his breath what smelled bad because he ate that those onions or something <laughs> we need and to he find thought it he was ugly immediately <laughs> alex I'm on the on case okay. <laughs> researchers also had mouth and jaw surgeons analyze portraits of uh, for facial features typical of mandibular prognathism, which is the protruding jaw, and maxillary deficiency, which is shrunken midface, they found that high mandibular prognathism scores positively correlated with higher inbreeding coefficients in the Habsburg family. So the more inbred you are, the more fucked up your jaw is going to look uh, in this family. <laughs> That's the scientific statement that right there. That is what was in the paper. <laughs> and for those who didn't understand what I just said, this means the Habsburg jaw and probably their other health complications as well were very likely a result of inbreeding. Charles II for sure had the Habsburg jaw and he had an inbreeding coefficient. You want to guess what his inbreeding coefficient was? Oh my God. 28.5. Four. Oh, we're we're going into the whole numbers. Point zero zero two eight four. Okay, no. Remember, <laughs> the family had an average of about point zero nine. So, what do you think Charles's was? Point zero two eight four. <laughs> Okay, you're not understanding. His, <laughs> I don't know. I don't Just know. Tell me. His, his was zero point two five. So, which is what does greater that mean? than point zero nine. I, that's what I was trying to say. Okay. What was it? Point, point two five. Okay. I was trying to say point. You 25. said point zero two five. I meant point two five. Cat. Today I was literally teaching <laughs> it's rising one sixth decimal. graders how to multiply decimals, and oh, now God. I feel like I'm at work, and I don't <laughs> like it. That makes well, great content, though. <laughs> you made me mad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I I didn't bring this on myself. You brought this on <laughs> myself. <laughs> So it's true. The very thing that kept the Habsburgs in power for so long ultimately led to their demise. And that is a story of Charles Habsburg II of Spain. Hurrah! Hurrah! <laughs> Hurrah! Hurrah! <laughs> that was amazing. Thank no, you for you're that lesson. so welcome. Is, <laughs> so is this the SpongeBob clip? Something smells like SpongeBob? Probably. My- no, Ooh. I don't think so. I think it was the one that, like, her her makeup and it's face this, melted off. This one. I'm almost as ugly. Well, look at me. I'm almost as ugly as you. <laughs> I always thought if I was as ugly as that guy, I don't know what I would do. Patrick. What's my mom going to say? Patrick. Oh, my gosh. If my sister finds out. Patrick. Oh, wait, I don't have a sister. The what did they eat? Oh, I think it was onion. Like, juice. some kind of, like, I mean, onion thing. But- Patrick! You're not ugly. Your breath stinks. Really bad. 
That's it. That's that's you're not ugly. Your breath stinks. <laughs> <laughs> For poor, what's his name? It was both. <laughs> okay, we'll be right back. Hey everyone, this is producer Alec. Kat and Haley have the night off from reading ads, so they gave me this primetime slot tonight to tell you about our new show on Night Classy's Patreon. We're calling it Smart Alec, and it features me teaching a full Night Classy lesson. Last month, I taught this story about five kids who take a raft out in Florida, and only one of them comes back, and you're never going to believe what he said happened to his friends out there it's wild and this month i can tell you here because i don't think cat and Haley are ever going to hear this i am teaching a cool lesson about a shipwreck that i've been wanting to teach for a while so if you've enjoyed my forest fin treasure thing or my oak island thing i did you're going to love this show so check it out on patreon.com slash night classy not only does it support the show but we have some primo content in there for you to enjoy so Come support the show. Come get some really cool Smart Alex stories from yours truly. And we love you and we will see you over there. Bye. Kat, have you heard of something called the Zoom Boom or the Zoom Effect? No. Well, I'm about to tell you. Okay. So this is something that has happened in, in lieu of the COVID-19 pandemic. Have you heard of in it? In lieu of it? Because of it. Okay. What does in lieu mean? I thought I used it correctly. I, thought, I don't know. Maybe you did. I guess I don't really know. In light I thought, of. Okay. <laughs> in the shadows of the oh. COVID-19 pandemic, we experience Zoom boom. Essentially, a lot of people, most people started it sounds, working. It, sorry. It sounds like FaceTime sex. <laughs> let's, let's, let's do a quick zoom boom go to Doesn't the zoom it? boom room yeah exactly yeah in the context that i know it, it that no but yes okay. that makes sense when you say that's that what I'm I, like, yeah. I thought I, because of your opening i was like that's not what it is but it, but sounds, it sounds like, like an urban be. dictionary thing it like does a zoom boom we need to make it a thing mm-hmm. i mean not like no, i don't not want like to do that it. but yeah like we need to we we coined the phrase zoom boom with a different meaning we can probably <laughs> add it to urban dictionary yeah we easily could mm-hmm. um have you ever added anything to urban dictionary no i don't know how me either in college not it wasn't urban dictionary but we had a choice to like write like a 10 page final paper or add a section to a wikipedia page that's and cool. the goal was to get us to do the Wikipedia page because like it was a lot less work technically. But I was just like, I can't I like I don't I can't figure this out. So I wrote I was like the I was the only one in class who wrote the paper. <laughs> How did you try like did you try? I didn't even try. I was like, okay, no. you're like I can't I <laughs> I'm can't just even gonna write the fucking paper. Fathom trying. <laughs> yeah. I, I can write papers all day long. Exactly. <laughs> What's one more paper? And then one of your fellow peers got to take, you know, your paper and then added it to the Wikipedia page. Nobody later. wanted to add that paper to anything. What was I your paper you on? That. Um, the, well, the class was actually awesome. It was uh, Black History in the West. Oh, cool. So I don't remember what it was about, but I'm sure it was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Much like our night classy lessons, we hear it and it goes in and then it sometimes falls out mm-hmm. the other side. But that's okay. Okay. Well, anyway, back to the Zoom boom. So after COVID-19, people started to work from home a lot more. They were on zoom and facetime and all of that and they were looking at their face more often than they ever had before and this has led to an increase in plastic surgery Mm. specifically from like the collarbone up um so anything that you typically see on a facetime call and so our our lesson today is on plastic surgery the history of plastic surgery. Cool. And I will say this lesson is definitely scraping the surface. I have a lot of information in here, but the further I got into it, it's just like it just kept yeah. going and going and going. This lesson is going to be a triggering for me because I've been desperately wanting Botox and fillers, like looking mm. into it. Yeah. So maybe this will... Uh, it's just so expensive. I... Uh, 
It's hard to justify. Yeah, it is quite expensive. I will touch on Botox a little bit and like what it was initially founded for. Mm. Um, fillers are definitely the most popular yeah. form of plastic surgery. I want a pointy chin. Oh, I've been obsessed. Chin. I've been obsessed with people that have, have like a, pointy a cute, chin. pointy like side profile chin, and I just I don't know what it is. I just she really wants want that, that. Habsburg's job. <laughs> <Habsburg job. laughs> <laughs> oh man! Well, but yeah. So go you, on. You want a fake chin? Yeah. Will what it will it stay or will it start to like? It'll go start out? to go away. You kind of yeah. have to get them like filled back in or dissolved and then refilled every now and then. What? I feel like <laughs> that's not that high risk. I feel like no, it's a... super. It's it's pretty chill. I've uh, watched some videos. Interesting. Yeah. Well, also, I like you. I want a little like swoop in my nose, oh, like a little pointy nose. Let me see your God. profile. I feel like. Yeah, I guess it is kind of straight. Yeah. I always pictured a little swoopy. My mom has like a perfect little like ski slope oh, nose. So cute. Bitch. <laughs> you look like Tinkerbell. <laughs> yeah. Um, my nose, there's no, <laughs> there's none of that. I it's, love your nose. Is it though. concave? Thank you. I love mm -hmm. my nose now too. After many, many years of hating, I will never forget the day I, I was like, I don't know, probably like 12 or 13 talking to my grandpa, but like, oh, I hate my nose. I wish I would have gotten like my mom sided and he's like well just get a nose job and I was like oh my god that did not help <laughs> <laughs> but okay maybe I will <laughs> uh, but now I love my nose and there's also a trend in plastic surgery that we're seeing now like there's this increase but also it looks like we're starting to decline as well mm. as trends change and there's this huge movement on social media about not just body positivity but body neutrality yeah i think we're also seeing like the backlash of the instagram face now like people are trying to like now it's going back in style to have a more natural face it's yeah. weird how faces and bodies like go in and out of style it's, it's super you're weird just born with yeah the, mm -hmm. your your physical characteristics yeah how can that be a trend it's, it's it's very odd yeah it's makes me sick <laughs> um <laughs> but anyway we're learning about plastic surgery the oldest reference to reconstructive surgery dates back to ancient Egypt. The Edwin Smith papyrus about 200, no, 2,500 to 3,000 BC tells of a nasal reconstruction surgery or a rhinoplasty mm. as we call it today. Historians believe this text is just an early trauma surgery textbook detailing case studies for a variety of injuries and diagnoses. And I think my new hobby is going to be reading this translated version of this papyrus text because it sounds really interesting to me. Great hobby. <laughs> there are several recommendations in this for a broken nose, including popping it back into <gasps> place and then splinting it. Okay. This is not plastic surgery like you're probably thinking of it, okay? Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't really start to look like modern day plastic surgery until, well, we'll get to it. Ancient Egyptians were no strangers to prosthetics either. In 2000, a mummy was found buried wearing a prosthetic big toe, which I have a picture of. And after doing a case study of other people who were missing their big <gasps> toe, they Why is it so big? <laughs> to make it stable. What? <laughs> I feel like their toes shrunk a little bit. You know, you can see the, the other mummified toes oh. are kind of like crunched up. Oh, there's, those are shrunk, the toes not big? I think it's probably both. I think, okay. you know... You, you shrivel up a little bit when you, yeah, you are mummified. You prune. You're, <laughs> you're preserved forever just in a And I think you state. balance a lot with your big toe. You just mm. don't realize it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what they found in these studies. So they, they were like, okay, well, we think it's for balance. But then they had other people who had had their big toes removed or were you know born without them or had some kind of disfigurement. And they think that that's what it was. And there's a hypothesis that this person in ancient Egypt had to have their toe removed due to diabetes. Oh, wow. Yeah. So they had the prosthetic big toe. But this lesson is really about plastic surgery. And the first description of reconstruction, like proper, may actually be from 6th century BC India. There's an Indian physician, Sushru. Sushruta, sometimes referred to as the father of plastic surgery, but to be honest, there are so many 
fathers of plastic surgery. I mean, you could just fuck around back then. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> you could declare yourself the father of plastic surgery. It was, it was human centipede all over the place. What? Like they were just like experimenting, cutting people up. Seriously. Yeah. They yeah. were. Like <laughs> it was it was a free for all. But he has documented performing advanced skin grafts for his time. Oh, wow. And last night, I did a deep dive on skin grafts. Have you ever done a deep dive on fucking skin grafts? No. You might not want to. (laughs) It was fascinating to me, but, you know, I just like stuff like that. But it made Mm. me feel, I don't know, just looking at the pictures and videos, it's... Uh, I don't want to say it's gross because it's like really amazing, but it's kind Is it of really horrifying. That, that bad? Well, they shave off like either the first couple layers of your skin, yeah. um, or they take off like the whole like section like uh-huh. of your skin like deep, and then what they've started doing is piercing holes in it so they can stretch it over the place that you Ooh. need new skin. You. You would like it. I would definitely like it. <laughs> Look up. There's some good, like, three-minute YouTube videos. Okay. I'll check it out. Um, but when I went to go to Google Images for skin grafts, all of them were blurred. It was, like, <laughs> a safety <laughs> setting on all of them. And you don't even want to know how many times I had to click, yes, I want to see this image. And whenever you Google image anything, it immediately shows you the most fucked up possible version. Yeah. Like the angry koala last yeah. week during extra credit. <laughs> So there's so many fathers or daddies of plastic surgery. Mm. These skin grafts were used for repairing noses. But unlike ancient Egypt, these noses weren't necessarily broken. In ancient India, there was a practice of removing one's nose if they committed acts of adultery or really broke miscellaneous laws. And this violent practice still goes on today actually in several countries but it's specifically against women Mm -hmm. although it was shameful to not have a nose because they would you know see you with your nose cut off you could get a new nose constructed can i add in a fun fact about like kind of similar thing so you know the yakuza in japan like the the big gang in japan it's kind of like their version of the mafia mm, okay um if you uh, like are in the gang and you do something bad a common punishment is to cut off your pinky and so uh, there's a lot of men i don't know a lot but there's there's men in japan that don't have a pinky and it makes it really hard if you leave the yakuza to get employment because it's a sign that you were a gang member So there's an industry or at least like a few people who specialize in making prosthetic pinkies for these people. Oh, my goodness. What a niche thing. Yeah. (laughs) Like, yeah, I'm getting into the pinky making business. I've tried. I've started researching it for a night classy topic a few times. Um, Maybe I'll actually do it someday. Yeah. Well, there you go. That would just be part of it. A little teaser. Yes. (laughs) Um. So they had kind of similar things, um, and it wasn't exactly like a nose, but it's still referred to today as the Indian method that they started employing. They would use skin from the forehead or from your cheek, and they would raise the skin and the fat and then, like, cut it off, skin graft it, and then transplant it into the middle of your face and try and just get it to kind of, like, sit like a nose. Okay. So it wasn't just flat like you had something there but yeah. it, it surely didn't look like the nose you were yeah born i can't with. imagine that helped i it, it helped enough okay. for people to go through with the procedure yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i don't know what's worth i guess you, you gotta just weigh your options mm. there this physician described basic principles of plastic surgery in his book um shushruta samhita Which was later translated and spread this practice. Plastic surgery is actually not called plastic surgery because it's plastic is involved. Um, It comes from the Greek word plastikos, which Hmm. means to form or to mold, which is also why we call plastic plastic. In 4th century China, doctors performed the first cleft lip repair. And in ancient Rome, they successfully removed excess skin from around a patient's eyes. This procedure 
is now called a blepar. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> blepharoplasty or an eyelid rejuvenation. Mm. And I feel like I'm gonna get this when I'm older because as you get older, you know your skin starts yeah. to go down, and I already have hooded eyelids. So I have to like raise my eyes, eyelids, not eyelids, my eyebrows, I feel like to mm-hmm. see. Um, but people will get this when their eyelid skin starts to droop down yeah. so much that it kind of pushes their eyelashes down mm-hmm. and it can interfere with their vision. Have Do you ever watch videos of like facelift before and afters? Oh, I haven't, but I saw some like diagrams of it. It's I saw lots of diagrams in this research. I know. I'm like, I would definitely get oh, a facelift. Oh, me too. <laughs> I'm going to look so good as long as I win the lottery it's for real. forever. <laughs> but I would definitely get a facelift, I think. I say that now, but who's to say? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I would probably get one. As I start to get more and more gray and white hairs, I remind myself, I'm like, aging is a blessing. Aging is a blessing. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it is. I'm all about natural beauty, uh, natural aging. But, like, it's like makeup. Like, I don't think... Plastic surgery should be stigmatized either. Like, if it's going to make you feel better, hard agree. You should, you should do it if that's, like, what you really want. Absolutely. I think if you're empowered to do it and you feel better, then, yeah, yeah. go for it. Yeah. Who cares? Who Life is short. It doesn't really matter. We're all just skin sacks. <laughs> We're meat bags. <laughs> it does not matter. <laughs> if you want your pointy chin, get it. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I might. You should get a chin that's, like, the grandpa from... Um, the cowardly dog what, is <laughs> what if i got a botched one and it looked like that and I, my face just looks like a crescent moon <laughs> oh that'd be cute you get alec and see like one of those <laughs> one of those silhouette silhouette i mean portraits done where it's like filled in black <laughs> My beautiful girlfriend. <laughs> this is my nightmare. Yeah, Alec is very anti fillers and Botox. It's just like you're the most beautiful woman I've ever met. And the I idea you. that you want a like a different chin and nose is like horrifying to it's me. It's just it's silly. Like filters aren't permanent. Like it's just like trying out a new look. It's like to me, it's like expensive makeup. It yeah. goes away. It's not forever. Like, why not? Who cares? It's just a body. Something to try out. Like, yeah. I had lip fillers. Those mm-hmm. lasted, like, mm, six months or so yeah. as, before they started to disintegrate. And it was like, okay, that was fun. But I don't know if I really need it. You know, it's yeah. something to try out. Exactly. But how do fillers curve your nose and chin? They, they're, it's like a, kind of like an implant. So they would inject fillers which is material into the tip of your chin to like push it out they put or the they'd material inject them into <laughs> under the skin they put, <laughs> <her> the, <laughs> they put her the filler into the chin or, or like for the nose they would <laughs> they would inject it to the bridge of your nose to make it straight and then put a little extra on the tip so mm-hmm. it would swoop up it's so insane, Kat. <laughs> <laughs> you have such a great nose. What are you? It doesn't talk- matter. I, I everyone has a great natural face. Like natural beauty is great, but like, why not have fun and like try something different? Agreed. Disagreed. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I have to agree. You, you're beautiful. Everyone's beautiful, mm-hmm. but it is fun to play around. Yeah. With it. Why not? If I don't like, you'll never know if you don't try. There we go. You show up next week and your like cheeks are full <laughs> and your nose is. Different. I look like the cat lady. <laughs> you get your buccal fat removed, which that is just. I think that's I, I, that's not right. reversible. Yeah. So that that's, that's a decision. That's for an sure. important decision mm-hmm. to make and to to really go through with yourself. Yeah. Um, but they were doing all kinds of crazy shit in the ancient <laughs> world. Those seeking reconstructive surgery had different motives and and risks to really weigh out compared to going under the knife in modern day eras <laughs> germ theory definitely changed the surgical game and the invention of anesthesia in the 19th century meant patients no longer had to get belligerently drunk to have surgery the need for plastic surgery though was really accelerated by war Massive amounts of soldiers with facial injuries poured in during World War I. Queen Mary's Hospital in London was the first to concentrate all the patients in one place. There, they practiced skin grafts, bone grafts, facial reconstructions, and wound stitching techniques, making really impressive progress in these best practices. 
And like I said earlier, there is absolutely no short of no shortages of patients. And there were a lot of surgeons who were ready to operate and share their ideas with others. It wasn't uncommon for two operations to happen at once in the same operating theater. And the surgeons would like look over each other's work and like give feedback. Uh, (laughs) This is not a multiple choice test, sir. (laughs) Eyes on your own paper. (laughs) It was like an art class they were doing. And they're like, oh yeah, look at that suture. <laughs> Are you going to re- use that scalpel for that? Mm. <laughs> the motive to improve how one looked was there, but it was such a small, small ember that was just really starting to burn. The main goal of repairing soldiers' faces was really to bring back their ability to do things like breathe and chew. <laughs> so that was there, but it was mostly just, you know, Functionally, we needed the plastic surgery. Injuries from the First World War also looked a lot different from wars past. Instead of injuries caused by small firearms and swords, soldiers were now facing heavy artillery, machine guns, and poisonous gas. So we had unprecedented weaponry, weaponry, which created unprecedented injuries shrapnel easily cut through facial structures and with trench warfare many soldiers were you know just popping their heads up over the edge and this caused a significant influx in facial injuries specifically it was gruesome and not easily patched up on the front lines of war Harold Gillies, a New Zealand surgeon, set up a special ward for facial wounds at the Cambridge Military Hospital. He was expecting and even hoping just to see 200 patients. He wasn't super well versed in this, but he saw the need and he thought he would get in there. So he's hoping for 200 patients. Well, he ended up seeing more than 2,000 patients being admitted to the hospital. Special labels were even sent out to the battlegrounds in France so that they could put it on a soldier being transported if they needed to go specifically to his hospital, send like directly to him. Demand was so high, the Queen's Hospital in Sidcup was established just for reconstructing faces. Once the soldiers' bone structures were repaired as much as possible, they started on the soft tissue, i.e. skin grafts. Surgeons at this time were really well-versed in skin grafts, but Gillies was unsure how he could manage these larger skin grafts being accepted um, in like the injured area. He did have an idea while operating on Willie Vacarjes. I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> the garage. <laughs> you paused like I would know. I know I did. I was like hoping that you could see through my eyes and yeah. read it and sound it out for me. But it's okay. Willie was at the Queen's Hospital because he was badly burned in a fire during the Battle of Jutland in 1916. His face was like all scarring to the point that he could not shut his eyes or his mouth. Oof. Yeah. And I do have pictures of this oh, that I no. will show okay. you. Oh, uh, so in the middle there, we see his before picture. Oh, that's the before. That's I the before. I thought that was the after. <laughs> I thought so too because the he after, looks pretty good. Yeah, the a- he looks fine in the middle his his nose is still there, yeah. but all of his skin is just so fused that he can't operate the muscles in his face. Yeah, he his- looks like he's wearing a mask and there's holes in his skin and then his eyes are back there. So you can see how he couldn't shut his eyes. Yeah, so the one on the right, he he now really looks like He's wearing a mask. Yeah, you can see <laughs> it's the like the Zorro looks like, mask. <laughs> it looks like a <laughs> made out like of skin. piece of bologna yeah. on his face, but it gave him loose enough skin so that he could operate the muscles of his eyelids yeah. and eventually his mouth so that he could actually shut his eyes. That's great. It also gave him those eyebrows. You know how people shave the tails off of their <laughs> eyebrows so they can draw yeah. them on straight. It gave him that. <laughs> they did because he only had so many eyebrows left after his like 
face was burned. Yeah. <laughs> they Lucy just like transplanted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they they made it work. And Gillies wanted to raise a Masonic collar flap of skin from his chest to repair the lower part of his face. So on the in the very left picture, you see what we see in his mask now, but there's a tube looking thing mm -hmm. coming off from the side. And this is called a tube pedicle skin grafting. And this was a new practice. The next picture is um, of the, the doctors Whoa. training wax models. Wow. So he figured that if he could get the skin to more easily accept these large skin graft areas, especially on such like complex and sensitive skin types as the face, he would need to keep it connected to the donor site until the accepting site could properly accept the skin. Is that true? Do you have to do that? Yeah, that's like common practice. Really? And, and not in all skin grafting. Yeah, because I thought they normally took it from like your butt and your thighs. Yeah, they they will. But if it's something, so I guess it depends on the surgery. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. And for people who can't picture this, it looks like you're tearing duct tape off your chest and sticking it to your face. It looks yeah, crazy. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it, it really like does. A strip of skin connecting your face and your chest. Yeah, and let me know if you have any questions because I, I feel like I have a good enough understanding of it now, but it took me a while of taking the time to understand what exactly was going on here. The reason why he tried this out was because as he was getting the donor's skin, he realized that it started to curl in mm. on itself. And he was like, oh, that's not a good sign. So he decided to sew the skin into this tube, which to his delight increased the blood supply and significantly cut down on infection. Okay. So what he would do is he would tie the skin together essentially and put the tube over the injured skin and once it accepted it it could be cut away from the donor site your you know skin flap could be pressed back over to the donor site and this <laughs> i don't know if i'm even describing this correctly but the donor skin now on the face that's been separated like from the mm -hmm. chest could then be spread out and smoothed out from there so okay. it's kind of like an in-between state of it connecting from the chest yeah. to the face you need it to like latch on like an avatar with their yeah. little tails first. yes exactly and then, they need to get their yeah. probe out <laughs> this was one small step for Gillies, one giant leap for plastic surgery. Methods and techniques for facial reconstruction were shared and developed in the medical community. And of course, Gillies is referred to as the father of plastic surgery. Mm, another one. <laughs> another one. Many of his techniques are still used today. And cosmetic surgery has evolved as a result of Gillies' work. But even though it came so far in the world wars, surgeons still wanted to be taken seriously and at least cosmetic motivated, like solely cosmetic plastic surgery wasn't mainstream yet. It was still kind of stigmatized. By the end of World War II, medical technology had improved and income was higher for individuals. They had a little spending money and there was a surplus of doctors. So all of these factors created a perfect storm for plastic surgery actually making its way into the mainstream. All of these doctors didn't have to work on injured soldiers anymore. So procedures like breast implants, rhinoplasty, and face restructuring were becoming more commonplace, but more often than not, they were for patients recovering from cancer, something that left them missing some feature that they desired. And Botox was originally created. Do you want to guess what it was created for? Or do you know? I don't know. Um, do you want to guess or do you want me to tell you? Migraines. You Ooh, that is a really good guess. Alec? Oh, I can't even guess. I don't know. 
It was originally created to treat crossed eyes. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. But the cosmetic industry adopted it into fixing fine lines. It was officially approved by the FDA in 2002, but it is now used for migraines and spasms. Mm -hmm. In 2020, there was a study that found or suspected hypothesize that Botox injections actually also helped with depression. Yeah, I've seen it advertised. The reason depression. yeah, the reason why they think that it can help cause depression is because it paralyzes the facial muscles that you use when you like scowl yeah. or like upset. And your facial expression impacts your mood. It does. Yeah. It's it's a feedback loop mm -hmm. between negative facial expressions and negative emotions. So it just kind of like halts that in its place. Yeah. They freeze you in a happy face. Yeah. Or you're just like so glad because you don't have fine lines anymore. That too. <laughs> it's a double edged sword. <laughs> so I have a few more random tidbits of plastic surgery as I was starting to deep diaper. Deep diaper. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds scary. Dive deeper that I just didn't have time to go into all the odds and ends of like early kind of like quackery mm, cosmetic I'm surgery sure. but there was definitely aesthetic plastic surgery in the before times in the u.s and it was probably performed by quacks and charlatans many surgeons have been given the title of plastic surgery but there are a lot of them who experimented one of them was this guy who described in the 1800s his implant materials that he would use as quote quite a variety of foreign materials uh bits of braided silk bits of silk floss particles of celluloid gutta perca which is used to like dental fillings um vegetable ivory and several other insoluble foreign materials he described cosmetic surgeries and methods actually years and decades before they happened. So he kind of like foresaw where it was going. Okay. Um, and he's another father of plastic surgery. <laughs> the first <laughs> <a> whole family. <laughs> no, they, none of them have the Habsburg straw because they all fixed it with plastic surgery. <laughs> <laughs> the first facelift was performed in the early 1900s. It took place in Berlin in 1901. Eugene Hollander was asked by Polish aristocrat to lift her cheeks and the corners of her mouth to accomplish this hollander removed an elliptical piece of skin from around the ear area and then he simply made the hole and then tightened the skin with sutures um at this point there's no attempt to lift the structures of the mouth that kind of came on later mm. but as early as the 1900s people were getting facelifts yeah. and they looked good so just look up like early facelifts and you'll see <laughs> i will be looking that up Here's our last really fun fact. It's, well, I don't know if it's fun. The first published account that we have for breast augmentation. Do you want to guess what year? Ooh, uh, 1914. 1895. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> this is when Vincent Cerny enhanced a woman's breast with a lumbar lipoma, a.k.a. tumor tissue. And early and wildly unsuccessful breast augmentation materials also included ivory, <gasps> glass balls, <laughs> no. uh, ground rubber, and oh. ox cartilage. Oh. Oh, no. In the 1940s, paraffin, a.k.a. wax, was used by Japanese sex workers to appeal to American soldiers. And then finally, in 1960 in Texas, two surgeons created the first silicone breast implants. Not till 1960? Not until 1960. Hmm. And even then, their first patient was Esmeralda, a dog. <gasps> no. A dog. No. Thomas Biggs, a resident, a junior resident who worked with him, said, quote, I was in charge of the dog. The implant was inserted under the skin and left for a couple of weeks until she chewed at her stitches and it had to be removed. OK, I'm glad they removed it. I'm glad they removed it. I'm mad that they did this yeah. in the first place. Yeah. Like, and for what? That's like, 
My it, favorite episode of the Kardashians is a really oh. early episode. <laughs> and they had this boxer dog that kept getting out and it was this was an early episode like when they were oh, still normal people yes. you know what I'm talking about I do now and it kept humping the neighbor's dog <laughs> and so they were like you have to get your dog fixed which what the fuck why wasn't it fixed in the first place okay and then uh, the whole like plot of the episode was they didn't want to take away its manhood so they were looking at like dog ball implants <laughs> <laughs> for this dog yes because he's gonna be so concerned yeah. about where his balls are I think his name was Rocky Rocky. <laughs> he needed he rocks needs his oysters. Rocky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Ugh. This is this is different. It's it's sad. I tried to find a picture of the dog, but if you if you look up Esmeralda like Aww. first breast implants, <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't pictures, want to. They're not real. <laughs> They must be photoshopped. I swear to God. It because is a dog <laughs> with huge boobs. Yeah. I don't want to see that. It's insane. Alex, stop typing. Okay. <laughs> it's insane. Um, implants were injected finally into a cons- consenting human adult, Timmy Jane Lindsay, which, what a Southern name. Great name. <laughs> she only went in to get a tattoo removed from her breast when the surgeons were like, do you want to try this new experimental surgery? <laughs> She's like, yeah, I think I do. Good for her. She was a risk taker. Yeah, it, it paid off. She loved the results and a new trend was born. Plastic surgery really started booming in the 90s. One study titled, quote, plastic surgery rockets as baby boomers search for youth and beauty <laughs> reports a tenfold increase from 1990 to the year 2000. Mm. The most popular procedure in the year 2000. Do you want to guess or do you want me to tell you? I feel like I'm quizzing you In the year 2000? Was it not yeah. breast augmentation? It was not. Breast augmentation was third most okay. popular. Was it nose job? No. I was going to say the cheeks job. or something. Think heroin chic. Oh, lipo? Lipo. Mm. Mm. Liposuction. 670,000 people in the year 2000 had liposuction. Second most popular was the eyelid surgery. Hmm. I will probably become a statistic. (laughs) And then breast augmentation and then facelifts. By 2005, cosmetic surgery almost doubled the amount of reconstructive procedures in the United States. And as I said at the top of this lesson, we are starting to see a decrease from the Zoom boom, partially due to COVID, partially due to changing taste. But by far, the most popular procedure is still Botox and fillers accounting for 85% of the 15.6 million procedures reported in the U.S. in 2020. Wow. And that is how we got to modern plastic surgery from shrapnel in World War One and Two. Wow. Well, thank you, shrapnel. Just kidding. <laughs> Never mind. She's going to jaw out. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you all for that learning journey. You're welcome. I can't wait to see your new pointy chin. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never do it. It's I just I it's you expensive. Dream about it. it is. Yeah. It's crazy. And Someday already, when I'm rich, you're perfect as you are. Oh, and then again, like Bruno power, Mars. like we said, I feel like it's it can be a- addicting. Yes, because so you start true. to see yourself differently, and you're mm-hmm. like, mm, do I need more? Yeah, and you get um, like dysmorphia almost. Mm-hmm. You, you can. You absolutely mm-hmm. can. All right. Well, thank you for that learning journey. If you are a Patreon or want to become a Patreon, we're going to continue our conversations over there and do some extra credit. I have the best fun fact for you guys this week. I'm so excited. So please head over to Patreon, listen to extra credit. And as always, thank you for listening to the show. We love you so much. And three, two, one. Class dismissed.